I just like went through all the PowerPoints quickly, a bird's eye view of what we did. Okay, and some of these, some of the points there, they'll feed into today's class. So, so hopefully, some of this will bring back uh, jog your memory a little bit and uh, bring back uh, like associations and thoughts that you have. Here's uh, here's the structure of our course. It was a six part course, um, two weeks on Kabbalah, two weeks on the afterlife, one on meditation. Today, reincarnation, angels, and demons. Um, so we, I know you never did take the MI mystic quiz. I regret that. I don't know how, how we can remedy that. I don't know. I sent it, but I don't think I sent it out. Did anybody do it at home? I did. Okay. It's on the, yeah. Okay. Uh, if, if I remember to send it out, um, anyway, um, so we talked here about like some themes of, of Kabbalah, of Kabbalah, of, of Kabbalah. Talked about unit purification, unity, um, something beyond. We brought some text for that. This is just like an overview. Um, so we talked about what Kabbalah is like to receive and how it got passed on secretly from generation to generation. And then this is very important for our course overall, the three streams of Kabbalah. Um, basically, uh, we focused on uh, three of them, really. Uh, focused on... Um, in the first two classes, we focused on the theoretical, speculative, which is like what's going on in the upper worlds, that type of thing. Um, this, we focused on the meditative stream last week. And today we're going to tap in a little bit to the magical stream in terms of the angels, the demons, the involvement, the interface between our world and the other and, and the spiritual world. Um, if we had our class on skula, skulot and the chams and those types of things, we would have really gotten to the magical, but we're not doing it. Um, so the theoretical stream, we talked about how it's like um, a GPS, basically, of what's happening in the spiritual world. And we talked about the texts, the meditative stream. There was a text from Rabbi Abu Lafia, who we also quoted um, in our previous class on um, meditation. It's the meditative stream. And the magical stream. So we talked about some principles of Kabbalah that Hashem is, is intimately collected to our lives, meaning Hashem didn't just create the world from above below, but Hashem is in the world. Hashem's in everything. Hashem vacated space to make space for the world through the principle of the Tzimtzum. Hashem's connected to everything. We're just doing an overview of the whole uh, semester really quickly, actually. Um, so we talked about how um, just like a, a Rebbe, is contracts himself to or like lowers himself to be or herself to be connected to the people that they're following that are following them. So to Hashem did so as if like removed made space for us to exist and Hashem's always with us in, in, in everything. Um, another nice plus of that philosophy is that everything's interconnected because everything's really part of God's and everything. So that teaches us that it's not just a good thing to be united. It's the truth. Like if the inner essence is that everything's connected, then it's it's the right thing. It's like the truth to be connected and united. Um, okay, so that was that was class one in like three minutes. Okay, here's class two. Some more principles of Kabbalah here. Not just that um, Hashem is into me connected, but our actions impact reality. Evil is real. We must combat it, and we should take the good from the bad. Um, here are some central texts of Kabbalah. If you remember that, we talked about the Zohar, we talked about the Arizal, we talked about Hasidut, we spoke about some themes of Hasidut, joy, finding Hashem in the world, prayer, authenticity. Um, and here is just a, a later, later teachers of Kabbalah, um, the Rashash of Asha, Rav Kook, and their unique types of uh, teaching. Um, and the second trend the second theme of Kabbalah that we've talked about is that our actions impact reality right and we spoke about like how um, you can impact things more than you think it's a great blood it's a great responsibility really um, and uh, you can do something here and with your consciousness you can impact something somewhere else because everything's interconnected um, and I try to make an argument for that maybe I'll send that to you I, I, I cropped it and I cropped that argument I put on my YouTube channel. Got like two views. Anyway, but um, never mind. But um, anyway, but like actually, it's a good. It was a good argument for that. Uh, so uh, basically, everything's interconnected, and you don't always see 
you don't always see uh, everything that's really there. There's usually some cases of that. Um, with the great responsibility. Um, and we said that tehilim neged tehilim, like tehilim against missiles. Like you can impact things on a spiritual level as well, by prayer, by, by learning Torah. Um, and the, the third piece that I, I spoke about, third aspect of Kabbalah, is, which I connect to a lot, is that it speaks about evil in a real way. We're going to see that today with the demons and with the with the, uh, with the reincarnation, um, that there's uh, negative forces in the world. And Kabbalah says that they're real. It's not just subjective. Uh, I think our culture sometimes really slips into subjectiv sub sub subjectivism and um, like um, saying everything is equally okay. And there's things that are good and there's things that are bad. And I appreciate Kabbalah that they're willing to say that. This is good. That's bad. Let's fight the bad. I feel like our culture sometimes has lost uh, lost a moral compass when it comes to that. To that, the Kabbalah can help restore it. I think in that way. Um, so here's just, uh, and finally, this idea that like God's blessing entered into the world. It was a certain shattering. I mean, we we talked about it in passing, really, and that um, in everything there is an aspect of good. Um, and so you might be fighting the bad on one hand, but don't forget that in everything there's an aspect of good as well in yourself, in others. So when you say, look at the glass uh, half full, um, it's not just like a nice thing to do. Again, it's like, that's the truth. Like there's really good in everything. We have to look deep beyond the surface to find it. Some people really solely themselves to the point that you can't see it at all. But it doesn't mean that there's not something there. Maybe some very evil people completely like, completely darken themselves. But um, so I really appreciate going backwards. That thinking, I brought a few examples of it um, here. It's a really nice text from Rabbi Nachman Abrezov. A person must find some good point within themselves. A person must take care to be happy always and to keep far away from depression. And you do this through seeing the good and that you've done. Uh, that's one one remedy for it. Obviously, he's not curing, trying to cure depression. Some people say Rabbi Nachman Abrezov himself uh, suffered from depression. It seems from his texts. So he talks a lot about, about that. That was basically uh, aspects of Kabbalah. Um, and some of them, again, we're going to be talking about today. Then we talked about the afterlife. Um, I talked about why I believe in the afterlife. Who gets in? Does it really matter? Stages of history, heaven, hell, revival of the dead. Um, so I'll just go over that very quickly with you. Um, we talked about like earlier texts for the afterlife. Uh, we have material compensation. Like the Torah says, if you, it, it, there's reward and punishment, but it doesn't talk about necessarily in the next world. It talks about in this world. If you do God's will, you'll get this, you'll get that. Um, but so there's very limited biblical mentioning of the afterlife. So we asked, like, why was that the case? We brought a few uh, reasons for it. Um, and then we talked about, like, who gets into the next world? We talked about Jews and non-Jews, non-Jews who are righteous Gentiles. They, they can get into the next world as well. We talked about also, like, how everybody has a portion in the world to come. What does that mean? Um, some people have um, front row tickets. Some people are in the nosebleed section. Everybody has their, their everybody has a share. And you might be on in one area, like a, you, you're very close up, another area you're far back. So whatever the good that we do in this world, that continues with us going forward. So you want to do as much good as you can. You build up your, your spiritual essence. You build up your, your, I guess, your spiritual world. And then that continues with you uh, to the next world. Maybe you can take your bank account with you. Your spiritual bank account, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's very interesting, yeah. I'll go on deeper into that. Rabbi, yeah. Can't earn any more mitzvah in the next world. You can't earn mitzvah in the next world, but people here, uh, according to our text, can help elevate you and bring merit to your soul. That's the Kaddish, yeah. Kaddish learning in your memory, uh, perpetuating, living, um, teaching the teachings of these rabbis. That there's that means they're still alive and that's still a merit to them or impacting reality in a positive way, your impact continues. So, um, so we said, why is it not central? Because Judaism is very focused on halacha. And so therefore we, we don't always talk about like, Christianity, like heaven and hell. We don't, because we're focused on all, all the things we need to do. Another one is that we're very for this world. Like we want to fix this world. It's a, a super important agenda. Sometimes we, so therefore like, we're not always talking about going to the next world because we have so much work to do here. Yeah, the wedding right now. They're they're building a block, uh, another putting another you know another um, block and building the temple, the spiritual temple, building Am Yisrael. Um, so 
Uh, they're building the world. Uh, you're not talking necessarily talking about heaven and hell in that moment. You're talking about you're going to build a beautiful life and bring children to the world and do wonderful things. So we're very pro this life. Therefore, um, therefore sometimes we lose, um, we lose. Do you think, do you think they want to sap their dopamine? Have to increase their joy. Yeah. Absolutely. Just, I guess they just got married right now. Yeah. Sure. That's pretty awesome. We we're just talking about it too. I mean, this, you I heard it. it's an actual wedding. Yeah, yeah, right now they just got they yeah. just they just broke the glass yeah. because that's that music they play. Yeah, Baruch Hashem. See, it's awesome. Oh, we don't know. We'll see them maybe. Soon. No, I saw them. I saw her already walk down the aisle. Yeah. Oh, okay. And Rabbi, yeah, yeah, you're talking about a pretty heavy topic. So when you see, I'm a firm believer, no coincidences. Yeah, for sure. It's funny. I just was talking about pro this world, and this is the most pro this world act. That's pretty cool. Um, another, finally, we said it's not talked about a lot because we're, we're focused a lot on love for God and not necessarily fear from a fear level, but more reverence and lofty interpretations of fear. So uh, we talked about the afterlife, the second class. We talked about um, um, who is the real you. This is a big, I don't know if you remember this, but we really got deep into this. Like, who is the essence? Are we our bodies or are we our bodies and our souls? If we are just our souls, sorry, are we are souls or are we body and our soul? If we're just souls, then our soul will continue forever. And if we're bodies and souls, then in the future, it'll be bodies and souls that are going to live forever. That was like a debate. Um, and so we saw that we really got into that one approach. This is the Ramban uh, says that um, you go up to heaven and you come back down into the body and that's going to live forever. That was the Ramban. Um, and for the Ramban, uh, the Ramban says it's just whatever people traditionally understand. You live this life and you go up to heaven. There's a stage where you come down to this world a little bit for revival of the dead, but then you're going to go back up and continue your normal afterlife, how people traditionally understand it. But really it goes, the crux of the debate is really, how do you understand the individual? And we're gonna see it's gonna play into our class today very strongly in terms of their debate around angels. Um, we had a really interesting um, explanation to uh, the revival of the dead. Sorry. That's somewhere too. Oh, we talked about hell, um, different models, it's cleansing. Um, or the pain that's there is like a certain life review. Like you get there and you, you're in the world of truth. So you see things in a true way. You can cover them up in this world. When you get there, you can't cover it up anymore. Um, and then we talked about um, weaning off the body. Like the pain of, of hell could be that you're slowly weaning off your body. The more physical you are, the more you're involved in course. You walk yourself the door. Uh, I don't know. They're going to come. Yes. Rena. Well, it's not the Probably not. Probably not. Close. Why are you buying this? Yeah. Yeah. Why are you buying this? 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 Yeah. Why the revival day could happen. We we'll talked about that. Um, all right. And then we had last week's class, which was oh, which was uh, meditation. We talked about different forms of meditation: hipoda dut, um, mantra, visualization, contemplation, mindfulness, Hebrew letters. All right. That gets us to our class today. What time is it? Oh gosh. Okay. Hi, everybody on Zoom. Okay. We did our review. How was that? Okay. Got a bird's eye view. Okay. Let's do, let's jump into our topic for today. Uh, reincarnation. Here's our, here's what we're going to do. Quick course review. Relatively quick. Um, reincarnation, angels and demons. All right. So I want to ask you, well, Let's ask very quickly, what will be some pros and cons of the of accepting the tenet of faith, which is will be um reincarnation as a tenet of faith? Like accepting it as true. How could that benefit that belief benefit us? Or how could it be harmful? Just like as being part of our mode of thinking.
What's one benefit of believing in reincarnation? I mean, if you love life, knowing you're going to come back to something. Yeah. So if you know, if you love life, you know you're going to come back. That can be a comforting idea. And it can also be comforting to a loved one who loses that person and feels like they will come back or they'll, they'll yeah. come back together. Yeah. Any other benefits of that line of thinking? Yeah, Sandy. If, if the reward is a good but reincarnation, then the benefit is to live a good life now knowing that reincarnation could be take you even to a, a higher level. Meaning, meaning there's reward beyond... If, the re, if there's different levels of reincarnation that in this world looks better than other levels, you know, like a level looks better than another level, then you work on this life to get or, that reward in the a better position in the next. Mm -hmm. yeah. For the better, yeah, yeah, What's right. Judaism's definition of reincarnation. Uh, so we're going to see there's different types. There's two types of like really two types of reincarnation. If you believe in it, okay. We're going to see. You do not have to believe in reincarnation to be a good Jew. Uh, if you get to the next world, they say you, you believe in reincarnation uh, or not. Um, you you could say whatever you want, and then they'll, then they'll send you back anyway. So it doesn't matter. No, I'm just joking. No, no, I'm just joking. But uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> no, um, but really, it's like it's not a tenet of Jewish faith. There's debate around it. That's why I kind of kept it till now. Um, but for those who believe it, believe in it, um, which I do, um, you're in good company. And um, the definition would be a person passes away from this world, their soul still needs some form of correction. It comes back in another body, and that body is a vehicle to help that soul rectify what it still needs to rectify. That's the idea. There's another concept, which is called Ibor, a very interesting concept in the mystical text where they say a soul uh, can come back for a temporary amount of time, like inhabit a body. Ever heard of a Dibuk, a Dibuk? Mm -hmm. The Dibuk is uh, like a, a negative soul that comes and attaches itself for a temporary period. And then uh, you need to do some sort of exorcism some form of like um removal of that spirit so in deeper mystical texts you'll have discussions around this so there's two types one is that the body dies and uh, the soul comes back in another body to fix what it didn't fix in the previous world let's say somebody um so that's again talking about the benefits wait, let me finish that and then come back um or the other one is that it'll come back for for whatever reason we'll see for temporary for temporary um period of time now the benefit another benefit we didn't mention of this philosophy is that um helps explain if you believe it um why um why people can die so young or why um bad things happen because maybe that person finished what they needed to complete they did they were did they reincarnated a few times mm -hmm. they came back the fourth time they needed to fix one thing they fixed that one thing and then they then they finished their their purpose, their rectification. Um, the negative side of that is that that's not very comforting to share with somebody, uh, you know, when they're suffering. And also it's not, uh, so people don't find comfort in that idea. Uh, and it's not, not and some people sometimes rely on that idea to explain everything. And I think that's also not helpful. Like there's a lot of reasons why things happen. We don't always know why. So, um, someone raise their hand. Okay. So, like, are you saying? I need to think about. It. <clears throat> so Sheila's thing. Sheila's thing. Something like you're going through life and things are going well. And, yeah. And can you hear Sheila? By the way, cool. And then suddenly you get this, oh. you know, horrible diagnosis. Like you're yeah. gonna die. So are you saying that maybe like somebody's come into my body? So, no. Thank you. And and that's you know maybe a reincarnated soul, a negative thing that and now I'm gonna die because I got this you know, negative soul. That's what I'm saying. That's the danger of these discussions. I feel like we don't know a lot about this. Like so you can't like bad things happening to good. People. So that's the thing. So when I teach my class on why bad things happen to good people, I I often don't mention reincarnation. Um, it's in a category of the four categories I speak about. I have a recording. I'll send it to you have, if you want. It's like the third category. Um, but it's like a, a, a way of explaining it. But like, I don't, 
I just don't know enough about this to say, oh, this person was a reincarnation of that, or that's why that person died young. I don't know. I just feel very uncomfortable speaking about that. I don't know anything about that. So I just stay away from it. But people do find comfort in that. So I'm putting that out there. Yeah. Um, so here's a few other um, a few other benefits of the it provides purpose, right? That's kind of what Sandy was saying. Like, I have a purpose. I have to finish my rectification in this world. Um, shalom. Wedding bride. Yeah. <laughs> That's just the purpose in our life. Yeah. <laughs> explain suffering. No, I'm just joking. I have purpose. That's all. Um, and it may explain. There's someone already sitting here. <laughs> We're on the topic of reincarnation. I feel like you've been here before. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Rabbi Goldstein, for those at home, just popped in. Um, okay, so it may, explain, it may explain weird coincidences or unique talents, right? So I've had people come to me and say, you know, uh, ever since my loved one passed, uh, this bird keeps coming to visit me you know I've, so is that a reincarnation i don't know is it is it a, is it is it a sign i don't know but like sometimes someone will have this crazy talent and and or like they'll speak a language that you have no clue how to even learn that language so some might if you believe in this you would say that they might be a reincarnation of some sort of soul they never learn this language but yet they can speak it you know there's there's talents like that in the world that's that's yeah, that's another way to explain it but um, so the cons is what we mentioned. No. Yeah. It would be good if you've already done most of your work for you to come back for a little point of time and die early when obviously you're being born to a family and the pain you're causing by leaving early, dying young. Yeah, correct. So that's why I don't get so deep into these explanations, but they those who will will believe in this and when they would probably provide an answer like maybe those individuals had their rectification that they were supposed to go through a certain amount of pain or certain suffering and overcome it and, and gain strength through that that was part of their rectification so that would be like um okay so there's no proof for its existence no consensus in jewish text and can be used in an insensitive way so that's kind of like some cons to believe now i want to show you um these are the 13 principles of faith. Maimonides, 13 principles of faith. It doesn't appear in anywhere here. These are 13 you need to know. We had revival of the dead is the 13th. The dead will be, will be again, but doesn't mean that they're going to come back. That's not reincarnation. That means in the end of days, there will be a revival of dead. But that doesn't mean that's not reincarnation. Reincarnation isn't on the list. So um, therefore, that explains why Rav Sadiq Aon, who was a 19th, 9th century um, philosopher, um, he said that uh, he said that um, this is nonsense and stupidities. Meaning, I won't go so deep into his arguments why, but um, he brought a few different arguments why he thinks it's po problematic. But obviously, if you if it was a tenet of Jewish faith, no one would say that. So, but we're not gonna we're gonna be going by the ones who say it is. It it is true and it is something we should believe in. So we otherwise we wouldn't have anything to teach him in this class. So we're not going to go by that. Okay? <laughs> All right. So, and truth be told, there's a lot of mystics who, I mean, there's a whole, this book, Shara Gil Golim, this is, this is like, this is serious Kabbalah. Like this is a translated into English. Um, but this is a whole book on reincarnations by the Arizal, by like the, the big, one of the biggest mystics in all of our tradition. He talks about reincarnation. I, just, I can open up to a page here. Um, in, in, uh, re reincarnation into a plant, reincarnation into the inanimate, into vegetation, into water, into animals. Is there a hierarchy? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, no, so he says it depends on your actions. So somebody who uh, didn't drink enough water in their previous life. So, no, I'm just joking. But uh, <laughs> now I'm not I'm making light of it, but it's a serious, he takes it very seriously, obviously. But my rabbis never, we didn't really talk about this in the sense that like, we live our lives like simple Jews. We try to serve Hashem. We don't get so involved in, in this. 
but we're teaching it. So we're going to go over it. But I, I, I don't want to make fun of it. But I, on the other hand, like, I don't want to be like, oh, no, like, whoa, like, uh, maybe like in this chair, there's a soul and I shouldn't sit on it. I'm not, you don't want to go crazy with this stuff. Okay. So, um, but here is a text, the Ramban is considered a, um, an important authority. Um, he says that the case of the Yibum, which is the Leverite, mar Le Le Leverite marriage, you know, somebody's, um, somebody's husband passes away, the brother, according to the Torah, if there's no children, the brother's supposed to marry the, um, the, 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 the widow, the woman, who, the woman whose husband passed. Now, what? <laughs> or, yeah, or that. Now, why is that? So the Torah says, so his name would not be blotted out from Israel, meaning to continue the name of the deceased. The Ramban, though, based on Kabbalah, says this is a great secret, uh, which is known to the eyes of the seer. So Hashem has given eyes to see and ears to hear. Ears to hear. And the, so he really didn't say anything. But basically saying that this is a secret. What's the secret? That the soul of the brother um, is supposed to uh, come back. The one who passed away is supposed to come back through the child that's born. So there's a secret there. I mean, there's a reincarnation. So that's a source that people bring. Like, I'm, he's not, no proof here, but it's basically saying like they connected to this. This. They seem to refuse too. Yeah. Yeah. I'll leave. Um, but I just want to show you a few texts here connected to. Uh, now we're in the world of those who believe in reincarnation. Here are a few texts connected to that. Um, here, the Zohar. There is one soul which is planted in a body once, twice, three times, and four times. And it is, it is punished for the transgressions of the first. The father, the son, the third, and the fourth generation are all one soul, which is not rectified and has not even tried to rectify itself. Meaning like the idea that it's one soul that keeps coming back, trying to fix everything he needs to fix. Now, yeah. the question is, uh -huh. how do you know that you're the third soul? Mm -hmm. You're better off I don't know if you need to know that you're the third soul. I think you should pretend you're the last soul and do the best you can. That's what I think. What? No? Yeah, you don't know. I mean, we're all sitting here. We don't know which. Soul correct. Like, so correct. If you if you don't if you believe in it, um, many say that many say like we're not. There's no new souls. Like there's like um, kind of people are still. I guess old souls or whatever. Actually, I don't, let me take that back. Uh, I think, let me take that back. I don't remember that exactly um, in an accurate way. Doesn't Hashem already have all the souls and when a new baby is born. <laughs> that's the thing. Yeah, it's basically like if you, it, those who believe in this would say that the souls are kind of hanging out right. up there. And then when it's time for them to come back down to fix what they need to fix, the soul will be inhabit a body um, and and do and use the body as a vehicle to achieve what it needs to achieve. Like I'd say, somebody um, didn't fulfill the mitzvot the proper way, so they'll come back into a very religious family or something like that. Like that, that would be the idea. Like not everybody merits to be raised in a religious family or whatever. Not every merits to come to shul, you know. So like they did the best that they could, and now they still have what to fix. So they come back down in another setting of the reality. Um, Is it part of the BT promotion for membership? <laughs> What would that be? <laughs> don't worry if you don't if you don't join this time. You'll come back. We'll get you again. No, um, so check out this text in the bottom here. Ready? Um, why is reincarnation necessary for the soul? This is the bottom text. Uh, since it since it gets purified in, in Gehenna, many when it goes to hell, there's a purification. Then it'll go straight to heaven. Why? Why do you need? Re, why do you need all this? She says. My teacher explained that there are two reasons for reincarnation. Because a person may be lacking in the observance of certain commandments, which are needed for perfection, and Gehenna, which is hell, can only purify, but not add that which is lacking. Or reincarnation can correct and purify things that hell, Gehenna, cannot purify. So maybe you come down and purify yourself once more in this way. This is because not all sins can be purified in Gehenna. Therefore, a person must return to this world to fulfill the mission of perfection. So somebody uh, might need to come down here, do the reincarnation, Purify, need to purify in order to get like to the higher levels of heaven. Um, that they can't achieve that purification necessarily through the process of Gehenna, which is hell. Is it? Yeah. So it could be a purification or a rectification. Yeah. I might have missed this class, but what was what's Judaism's definition of hell? And it sounds like it's 
you're either temporarily there or you're permanently there or what's the deal? Yeah. Uh, that's that's going to take us a little far off. <laughs> um, but we tell we taught a whole a whole class on that. Okay. So um, yeah, that's it's a no, it's a good question. It's just um, all right. So I have a topic here of ebors. I'm not going to go super deep into this, but what I want to talk, I still wanted to say that there's a, there's a, another reality. I have like a bunch of texts on this. It's very interesting, but um, I want to also get to angels. I want to get to demons as well, but um, I'll just read a little bit of this with you. Ebors um, are something different. Now you would never hear about this. Even those who talk about reincarnation don't really talk about ebors. Ebors is like, this is a far out topic, but this is basically like the temporary inhabiting of, of, of the individual by a soul in the other world. So it can come and inhabit for a temporary period of time. It's not like you're born into a body and then you're living in that body your whole life. It comes down, it visits, and then it goes back. So there's an idea like that in deeper mystical texts. Okay. It's when you're living? While I'm while we're living, a soul can come down, inhabit, and then leave. An example would be like Sadiqim, very holy people. They're very connected to the spiritual world. So sometimes they uh, like a spiritual, they can do feats that are beyond our imagination because they like uh, higher level souls attach themselves to them and they inhabit them in a way. And they're able to do fantastic things due to that. It's like downloading in a way. They download for a specific time, a certain program into their system and that enables them to have extra features uh, for good or for bad. So it's a, yeah. It just seems there's a the other side. It just seems there's a dark side to that because when you say that, it's like almost just, just something from an, something from another world is coming taking possession. Correct. So we there are there are cases like that's the dip up. There's cases in our tradition. There's a um, I taught a class on this once, but uh, like on uh, cases of people who are like. Um, uh, we're, in, we're taken over by like a by like a negative spirit. And what happened? I want to hear. So what? so uh, there's a whole process that mystics know, uh, and they it's like an exorcism. There's a way to like exercise not exercise but exorcise um, that spirit uh, from the individual. I mean, and, it's a, and do, is this based in Kabbalah? Based in Kabbalah. So again. Now we're not, we're not only about, we're not only a topic of reincarnation, we're on the topic of like temporary reincarnation, temporary and inha have what? Possession. Possession, really. Possession. So I'm not going to go so deep into that. I feel like that's going to uh, kind of like weird us out a little bit, but um, yeah. Um, but I would just like to summarize the topic of reincarnation, maybe field any question you may have. Basically the idea is that um, if you, those who believe in it, um, these, the soul comes back and inhabits the body to fix something. Um, and according to the Arizal, um, it can inhabit all kinds of things. Maybe someone needs to correct something um, as a woman, as a man, as a Jew, a non-Jew. There's all kinds of uh, types of reincarnation. Um, I actually, I believe in reincarnation. Um, I don't know. I, I, I just believe in it. I, uh, I, th I think it explains certain things. I just don't. I don't like play around with it too much in my head. I'm not trying to figure out like, oh, you know, they asked that question because they must have been oh, a, a weirdo in the past life or something. I'm not, you know what I'm saying? I'm not like, I'm not, I don't get involved that deeply into it. But um, if you don't believe in it, uh, that's okay as well. But I've come across many people who have shared many stories with me. And it seems from their stories that they believe there's some type of interface, some type of continuation for the soul, not just in heaven, but also in this in this world. Um, I've had many people share stories uh, about that with me. So, Probably. Yeah. Um, just one thing that I've heard a few times in stories and a friend of um, my aunt actually told me a story of this is sometimes, you know, when you say two people are shared, they will say like, they will, they know like instantly, like very quickly. I mean, like, like, so quickly that they're for each other. Yeah. Even if they, like, I've heard cases where people were married and then they got divorced and then they met somebody and real quickly they they knew it was yeah. like a perfect- a soul, a soul connection, soulmates. 
that type of thing. Right. So it's like maybe like it's that thing you were saying about that movie, like maybe they had been married before and had this connection and then they reconnected again and they just knew. Like it didn't yeah. take long. Yeah, or like correct, or something like deja vu, that type of thing. Or like you felt like this happened before. Um, there's some sometimes there's like little windows into this belief system. Or like you just feel like this feels so familiar. I don't know. It could be that it's happened before, or it could be that not. It could be that your souls, it could just be like your souls have an interconnection. They don't have to believe in, in reincarnation for that. You just believe that like your souls are connected. They've always they were hewn from the same place in in the divine or whatever. So yeah. Um, any other questions on on this topic before we go on to yeah, yeah Lark. Maybe sometimes you just want to connect to a soul of somebody that you loved so much that you try so hard to believe and to connect. Is that a thing? That happens, yeah, for sure. For sure. You just um, want it so bad that... I mean, there's cases like that in the Jewish world where um, like certain rabbis have passed away and other people are, have trouble accepting that and they say that the rabbi is still alive in different ways like there's there's movements like that actually um, I wasn't going to name the name but I'm just saying it <laughs> happens among some people like it's hard to let go it's hard to let go it's hard to let go we all have it we all have people that we love and we want to keep the, their memory alive in different ways so maybe some people will attach to this for that reason but it's also someone has help guide you in a certain belief system, it's hard to replace it. So you find ways. To yeah. So there's a lot of psychological components to the belief in this. Um, that's, that's true. Yeah. yeah. I just also think, you know, when loved ones pass away, like specifically like parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, that, you know, you have the nature nurture too. Like you're going to, like you learn things from them and you will do things the way that they did and want to carry on and how they behave. Right. So that's, so, that's, so is it, is it just, you know, familial patterns of behavior and how you've learned? Everybody would say that that's very important and that's how the memory continues. And right. this is a different belief. This is taking it to the next level, saying that there's a soul. It comes back down, but I mean, yeah, that's true. Also, I think of the rational. Stuff. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Versus the yeah. Fear. All right, let's let's go back to, but let's go back out of the rational. Okay, but we'll we'll have our rational explanations for this. Let's go into the the, the world of angels. Okay, um, I'm going to show you that there's a lot of a lot of lessons we can take from angels, um, and we're going to go into what Judaism believes in angels. So. We come home. Shalom aleichem, We come, come home from shul. We sing shalom aleichem. What are we doing? Hello, ministry, ministerial angels, messengers of the highest, holy, holy, blessed be He. We, 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 we angels are accompanying us from shul. The tradition tells us, um, and when they and we sing to them at the, at the Shabbos table, you know, shalom aleichem, malachei asharei. So our tradition is filled with descriptions of angels. What do we do with it? Okay, we'll figure that out. But what I first want to show you is that angels are everywhere. Every day in our blessings of the Kriyat Shema, we mention angels, we mention the Hayot, Ofanea Kodesh, um, um, in, the, in the blessings of the Shema. When, we, when did Shalom Aleichem become part of the Shabbat tradition? Well, I don't know the history of it. I have to look into that. You know, the problem is a lot of with a lot of I think I can speak for a lot of us. We have this Christian idea of what an angel is with wings and it's yeah. white and it's yeah. glittering. When yeah. my understanding uh, that about, I learned recently that sure. in Judaism, angels are messengers. They are. They they are that. Um, and there's, uh, there's also a lot more, but they're not necessarily the picture with the angel with the with the wings. And in 17 minutes, you'll know. <laughs> All right. So we have uh, the Chagadia. 
We mentioned an angel there, the angel of death. So we say this, we say this in our, so we have to understand what it is. Okay. Um, so, and in Jewish law, there's references to, um, to angels. Um, it's very interesting law here. It says someone who enters a bathroom should say to the angels who accompany them, be honored, honorable, holy ones, uh, leave me until I enter and do my will and come back to you. Meaning the Talmud says that like persons walk around, we walk around with angels. When we go to the bathroom, we should say that we don't practically say this today. Say angels, wait out here. I have to go handle my business. I'll be right back. Right. So, um, so, uh, Mishnah like Bura says, what? Kind of like they're on your shoulder. Like, Maybe. I don't mean, there's some sort of, uh, anyway, but we say we don't do it today because we're not on that level or whatever. That's the bottom line halakha on the very bottom here. But I'm just showing you that this is a really tangible belief that appears in the Talmud and Jewish law. Like, there's these angels, I have to say, wait out here till I go, go and I come back. So, um, well, we do it basically today by not saying any brachot or any Torah while we're. That is to, to that's to honor the. Same it's a belief in something yeah. spiritual. This is like the next level. There's like some sort of like yes. angel. Yeah. Okay. Um, so here's a nice description of different levels of angels. But what I want to show you is that there's like we have angels for different different levels of spirituality. These are ones that are mentioned in Tefillah. The ministry angels are those that appear to man on earth. So there's higher angels as well. Other angels can only be seen prophetically. Ministry angels can also be seen physically. All right. So here's the big debate around angels. So there's debate around angels as well. Rambam and Ramban, the same rabbis who debated what the afterlife looks like. If it's just spiritual or if it's physical and spiritual, the same debate happens here. Rambam, what do you think if anybody was following that first debate, what would he say, the Rambam? Is it only spiritual or is it spiritual and physical? You said spiritual? Okay, good. Good answer. The Rambam would say that angels are something, um, are really just like, a, kind of like a, fig, a figment of our imagination. They're not something, um, they're, in, they're in, our, in our thoughts. They're not necessarily real beings. So he says, anytime an angel appears in the Torah, it's not really talking about a real case of an angel appearing. It's, it's talking about that it's seen in a vision. So it wasn't a real, wasn't a real occurrence, the Rambam says. He's basically saying, we don't believe in this stuff. So the difficulty with the Rambam is, yeah, um, Yosef, uh, Yaakov fought an angel all night, right? If that was just a vision, why did he come out limping? It seems that something real happened there with an angel, right? So, so the Rambam says, no, angels are real. Uh, and uh, well, you're saying it's all a figment of our imagination. That's not accurate. It doesn't align with any of our texts. It's like Hashem, when the angels, if I understand correctly, were ready to celebrate when the seas parted and the Egyptians were dying. Yeah. And Hashem said, no, 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 you don't. These are, I, these are my people in my image too. Uh, so it seems to me it would Pretty much, I mean, it's too much, seems like in the Torah. Correct. There's, There's so the much, that's what the Ramban's going to say. So let's turn the Ramban, the Ramban. What I want to do is through them, I want to get us to like some practical applications of all these teachings. So, and um, if we have time to get to some of the, the demon stuff, demonology, okay? Um, and I, I think that all this stuff has lessons for us. That's why I, I kind of want, I wanted to teach it as well. Um, so Ra Avram had guests. Those guests were three angels, okay? They came to visit him, the Torah says. Okay. Um, three men, Malachim, standing near him. They came to visit him. So the Rambam says the angels are incorporeal. They don't have bodies. They're intelligence without matter. And the bottom, they exist entirely in prophetic vision and depend on the action of the imaginative power. Meaning they're seen in a vision. They're not real. The Rambam triggered by that. He says, how could you do that? He says, um, and behold, according to his words, Sarah did not baked cakes. Avram did not, I mean, when these angels came, <clears throat> this is all a vision. Sarah didn't make them cakes. Avram didn't invite them in. All this stuff is just a vision. So all the stuff in that story didn't happen, but the Torah says it happened. Uh, and, and he says like, so Sarah did not laugh when the angel said, you're going to have a, a, a child. Rather, everything was a vision. And if so, this dream came with much detail, like the false dreams. 
He says, also, a man wrestled with him. Uh, an angel wrestled with Yaakov. Was that all a vision as well? So it seems like, uh, similar to Ned saying, <laughs> that all of uh, all these cases of angels are real, the Ramban says. So what is an angel? He says in the bottom, it is the glory that is created with the angels that is called, uh, those, by those who know, a garment, perceived by the eyes of flesh, by those of pure souls. We have to have a pure soul to be able to see this this aspect of spirituality, but he says it's a real thing. Um, and we can't always see it. Yet it's only very pure and they have that vision. They can see, see it. They can see these, these spirits. Um, so, so uh, we talked about the crux of their debate. I know it's like a little bit theoretical, so I know it's a little bit late also, but I'm just going to give you this, this thought and then we'll get into some practical applications. The thought behind their debate is that the Rambam is very philosophical. So he has trouble saying anything physical um, could be spiritual. So therefore he says an angel can't be a physical thing, can't be something in this world. So he says it's not real. The Ramban, who always connects the spirit and the physical, even the next world, when he said they're going to be together, he's able to say that the, the angels are real because angels can inhabit and be in this world because he believes the physical and the spiritual can connect. Okay. Those who got that, they got that. Those who didn't and feel like it's late, I understand. Okay, so I'm going to move on to, uh, to, to what we're doing here. Um, this, is a, this is an interesting, so, so those who believe in angels, here's a little view of what it could be. Angels have bodies from a Kabbalistic text. Angels have bodies that are very thin, ethereal, like the wind that is fine and not seen, for their bodies are from air and fire. It says on the bottom, angel who guards over a person has that image of that person. So if that helps you understand what it is a little bit, it's something very fine, very ethereal. Now, here are two cases of actual, um, there was, there's a concept uh, called a Magid. Um, anybody ever heard of this concept? Um, our, some of our greatest sages claim to have had Magidim. A Magid is, Lagid means to say, the Haggadah is to, 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 to deliver, to give over information. So some of our greatest sages claim that they had a Magid, which is a type of angel who helped teach them things. Okay, delivered information to them, downloaded information into them. So we have a case of Rabbi Yosef Kar, who was one of our biggest sages. He wrote the Shulchan Aruch. He had a, he had a Magid, and he wrote a whole book called Magid Mesharim. Uh, the, that's the picture here of messages they received from this Magid. Similarly, um, it's very interesting. It says, um, the major statements of Kar's Magid were sermons, interpreting the secrets of the Kabbalah. The Magid guided Kar in his wanderings in Turkey, etc. Um, the, the Kar's Magid, uh, Yes, of Karo's Magi was the Shechina, etc. The Magi spoke to him while he was awake, often just as he awoke. We have here Ramchal also was one of our biggest sage, one of our bigger sages in the last um, 500 years. Um, he he claimed to also have had a Magi. So very interesting. So those big rational rabbis, they claim to have some type of interface with some sort of spirit who taught them um, teachings. Very, it's very interesting. Uh, that Rabbi Yosef Kara has a whole book where he, he wrote down the teachings that the, the Magi taught him. It's called Magi Mesharim. Like the Magid's teaching him his teachings. So very interesting. I wanted to bring this just to show that for those who believe in it, um, there's rabbis who, who shared experiences that they had with a certain interface. Yeah. So is this supposed to be something they relate from Hashem? Is it supposed to take that person to a different level? Yeah, I mean, angels, the Torah talks about angels as well. Like an angel walk uh, while they crossed the, the sea, there was an angel there. An angel is a messenger, as you said, of Hashem. An angel does Hashem's will. An angel is, an, is not an independent entity. Right. An angel works Hashem's, uh, does Hashem's bidding. Um, and it's in sort of interface between Hashem and us through these through these forces, through these, 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 these beings, personas. Um, okay. So let's talk about some practical components to this, okay? Um, so one way, so how do you make sense of angels? Number one, you could believe in them. Uh, you could not like the Rambam, or you could say, uh, which I lean to, to say, like that there are these spiritual beings in the world. Now, what do we do with that? Like, what, what do we do with that? So one way um, that many explain angels that, that can help us in our lives is to say that um, we, we, we create our, these angels, like we can create our own spiritual angels through our actions. And so the more good you do, the more you build yourself like positive, positive spirits, positive angels. So I mean, as Abba Yaakov says, one who does a single commandment requires a single 
angelic defender. What is a single sin? Acquires a single angelic persecutor. Meaning we, it's not just like this angels that like are, we're, we're dependent on them, but rather we can create um, almost like an angelic force field through our actions. And so that's something that's not just something like theoretical, something connected to our lives. We say uh, we want as much protection as possible. The more, more good we do, the greater, um, greater we connect to these spiritual beings, we can create spiritual beings as well. It says, Rabbi Yosef Bar Yehuda says, two ministering angels accompany a person on Shabbat evening from synagogue to his home. One good angel, one evil angel. And when he reaches his home, he finds a lamp burning and a table set and the bed made. And the good angel says, may it be your will that it should be like this for another Shabbat. And the evil ant, angel answers, amen. And this is the source actually for Shalom Aleichem. So create good angels, create good energy. Um, so that's a one way to interpret it, like in a practical way, like keep creating good energy. You'll be surrounded by good energy and people are surrounded by good energy. Good people want to be around that. Okay, so that's one application for this. Another way to make it relevant is to say, like, we can use angels as a model for us in our lives. Like we want to aspire to an angel, angelic level. So we learn from them how to stand in the, in the, in Shmona, in the prayer. It says their legs uh, were a straight leg. It says about the angels. Um, and so that's why we stand straight during davening, like angels. But this is more symbolic. Like we want, we, we can't, no one's an angel, right? But we want to strive to that. And so learning about angels can be helpful for us and seeing like how they perform Hashem's will uh, without hesitation, how they, uh, all the good that they do, we should try to strive to that level. We can't reach it, but we can strive to it. Here's another practical application. And I think this is one that um, you, you might find very, um, resonant um so you can make yourself into an angel what do i mean by that like if the more and more you try to do the right thing try to do god's will after a while um god starts working through you to help others um, i've seen it many times because my in my line of work where we're always helping people um the more and more you put yourself out to help other people um like miracles can happen through that um, I put a picture there of Rabbi Arya Levin. He was a, a rabbi who used to visit people in jail. That was his, like, one of the things he did. Um, but we visit people in hospitals. We, take, we help take care of people as rabbis or you know, hopefully as people in the community. The more good that you do, uh, the more you can elevate yourself to a level where Hashem starts working through you. What do I mean by that? Like Hashem, Hashem uh, wants to help people, right? And so if you become the vehicle for that, Hashem uses you to help. Um, uh, say, for instance, you commit to supporting a certain charity um, and maybe Hashem wants to support that charity. So Hashem can keep giving you funds, what you need to support that charity. Or, or let's say you, um, I, mean, I had a situation where I was, um, I, I put in my mind, I said, I made a commitment to help somebody to be with them. They were like in hospice at the time. And um, I wanted to, it was actually not even a shul, it was a, not even a shul member, but somebody's shul member's family who had family here. So I, I said I'm going to try to help them, and um, a lot of miracles happened while I was trying to help them. I felt I'm not saying I was like an angel, but like I was through tapping into an angelic actions, being caring and good to other people. After a while, you attach yourself to like an, a different a different plane, and I saw. A lot of miracles, like I like I wanted to go out, but it started raining really hard. And I said, I'm going to go anyway. And I went, I visited, um, and it turns out they, they ended up like passing away just a little bit later. And if I didn't go at that time, like I would have never have seen them. And I got the call on my way back, and I like, ended up being able to go back there and be with them. Like all that stuff happened because I committed to it. But that's just like one situation I'm sharing with you. But if you put yourself in the mode of angels, you put yourself in the mode of service of others, um, you can see wonderful, amazing things. And so it's basically just like putting yourself in that place with money, with energy, with chesed, with kindness. And uh, there can be a certain flow happens and, uh, and Hashem could start to work through you. So that's another thing we can learn from the angels or, or a way to live a more of an angelic lifestyle. Uh, let me share with you one more here. Um, another thing is that like this concept of angels can be very um, comforting. Like there's angels, Hashem appoints angels to take care of things and Hashem's always trying to help us. There's, there's angels, there's beings, there's angels that you might've come across in your life, people who helped you along the way. And when you think about it, it can be very empowering, very comforting to know that Hashem plants people 
or, or individuals or, or experiences along the way uh, to help us and to be with us. It could be a spiritual, it could be a physical angel. So these are some ways to make the whole concept of angels something that connects to us uh, beyond the idea, the theoretical idea that there are angels out there. Those are four, like four applications of that. We don't really get to uh, get to, to the demons. It was already eight o'clock. I'll just share with you two things that were taught to me about them, okay? And this is, don't mess with them. <laughs> yeah, don't mess with them, okay? What does that mean? My rabbis used to say, like, same thing for angels. There's, there's a lot of texts about demons. Now, what do we do with that? It, you could get very scared and just, you know, hide under your covers. Or um, you could say that, like, um, similar to the angels, like, it's the negative energy that we create. In addition, my rabbis used to say, like, our texts talk about it, but you don't have to talk about it. <laughs> Meaning the more uh, the Gemara says that uh, this is the rule of the matter is all are particular about pairs. Demons are particular with them. If one is not particular, they're not particular with him. Meaning the more you mess around with these things, the more they mess around with you. Like it's like the Ouija board effect. You don't mess around with the Ouija board. You won't get in trouble. So the same thing. If, if we, our texts do speak about uh, demons and angels, the more you speak about them, the more you try to impact them, the more you try to fight them or, or whatever, the more, um, the more you're just causing yourself trouble. So the idea is stay simple. That's what I always tell you. Stay simple, believe in Hashem, do the right thing, and uh, you'll build a lot of angels for yourself, a lot of positive things. So they say, say they don't really mess with them. But there are some very interesting texts we're going to go back over here connected to them. Final thing is, uh, very interesting. So I, I once, when I first became... Uh, more religious, I uh, spent a lot of time, um, I was at Yeshiva, Merkaz Rav, and my Rosh Yeshiva was Rav Avam Shapira, former chief rabbi of Israel. And I used to ask him like a lot of questions. So I asked him like about demons because we were learning about it in one of the texts. He's like, well, what happens is, I, I go, he goes, um, I go, our texts talk all about demons, but, why the, but the Rambam said that they don't exist, similar to the angels it says in the imagination. The Rambam in, in the 12th century, he said they don't exist. And he goes, yeah. I go, how could he do that? He goes, well, the Rebbe, the Kutzker Rebbe said that once the Rambam said they don't exist, he, he made a reality that they no longer exist. And so from the Rambam and on, he says they no longer exist. So the power of Rambam was that he was able to say, I don't believe they exist. And through that, he was able to establish they don't exist. Is that the case or not? I don't know. But but the idea is that, um, the idea is that, uh, it, that's, that's what I want to take from all this, just to put it together is, from reincarnation um, to 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 um, to angels, um, there's a lot uh, that we can learn from them. There's a lot we can learn from the spiritual world. Okay, <laughs> um, and um, and uh, there's a lot of lessons that we can take from them from our lives. I tend to o overall with this whole course, I lean more to the spiritual, more to the mystical. Uh, but I hope that I was able to provide you like with some rational directions along the way.